great. Maximilian, welcome to Cassandra. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me today. I look forward to speaking with you. So, Maximilian, you studied um, economic statecraft, economic warfare, um, geoeconomics for a long time. So let's like take us back in the beginning to make this a little bit like a primer format about like, you know, let's define the terms a little bit in the beginning, like what we mean when we say that obviously um, this geoeconomics uh, concept became big recently and was, uh, was yeah. I think, after the Cold War for a very short time period. Um, so, yeah, take us a little bit on, on the journey. Like, how did we get where we are right now? Great. Uh, well, you know, I, I think it's definitely worth defining the idea of geoeconomics, um, which is essentially, you know, another take on how states compete geopolitically with one another, but using uh, the economic understanding to see that. So, you know, so often political scientists will focus on things from the language used in State Department announcements to the way votes go uh, in the United Nations and so on and so forth. But geoeconomics is really looking at how states use their economic linkages, how they use their um, trade relationships, how they use their development agendas, so on and so forth, and in particular their monetary and financial agendas to advance state interests um, and how this leads to competition um, with one another. And so it's on the back of you know this type of framework that uh, I've written my um, forthcoming book, which is titled Economic War, Ukraine and the Global Conflict Between Russia and the West. And in that, I, I said out this, what we've seen in particular most recently since the beginning of 2022, but also looking at the history of how we got there from 2014 uh, in the first invasion of Ukraine until the second one, how simultaneously with Putin's invasion of Ukraine, there has been this economic war between Russia and the West. And I think the economic war sits on a niveau above that of, say, the trade war between the West and China, because you can look at the trade war between the West and China as a quarrel for the spoils of the international economic order and the benefits of it, whereas I think the fight that you're seeing between Russia and the West, although Russia is certainly a much less powerful country in geoeconomic terms than China is, it is still a significant right. power, but there I think it's really about the fundamental rules of that international economic economic order rather than the spoils of it all right and like when you know when we look at um when we look at there were lo lo loads of sanctions and you know that there has been a, a lot going on like when we make an assessment now where we are at today like how you know who are the winners who are the losers and you know, what were sanctions? You know, there were a lot of discussions. Okay, sanctions are not successful. Sanctions, or others say, like sanctions take a lot, you know, a long time, and, and these kind of things. Like you know, everything. Let's say as a package, the West yeah. has done. You know, how would you kind of you know like um, you know define its impact or say, okay, so this has worked, this has not worked, and you know, are there any kind of particular instruments that were more effective and less effective? Certainly. Um, you know, firstly, I think it's important to define, you know, what do sanctions aim to do and how do we measure their effectiveness? Right. And very often you'll hear discussion of that sanctions are meant to cause a country to change its policy course or to take a certain line of actions that the sanction imposing country wants to do. Uh, there certainly is an aspect to that in sanctions policies. Um, some research by Daniel Dresner, uh, academic and, and, and uh, political scientist who wrote a book over a decade now called the sanctions paradox focused on how this actually really worked most effectively against countries that have good relations um, with sanctions imposers so for example sanctions have never convinced north korea to give up its nuclear weapons but the threat of sanctions against south korea in its relationship with the united states in particular in the 1950s and 1960s really dissuaded it from pursuing a nuclear agenda although it was talking about doing so then and at later times um, as well well, with regards to Russia and the West, however, I think that we get into the second um, more um, 
conflict style use of sanctions, which you've seen in plenty of other cases, uh, including with the United States against Cuba for many decades now, um, in with the Trump administration and before that with sanctions on Iran. And that's where sanctions are really targeted and used to lower a state's capacity and ability right. to wage war or take certain actions. So I think the 2014 to 2022 sanctions imposed by the West were not effective because they primarily aimed at trying to deter Russia rather than limit its state capacity. Whereas since 2020, there's been an almost universal recognition by the sanctions imposing states uh, in the West and its allies elsewhere, including Singapore, Switzerland, um, Japan, South Korea, um, that sanctions are being used now as a tool to weaken Russia's state capacity. And there, I think they've been very effective, um, both okay. in terms of the technology sanctions and in particular, the monetary and fiscal sanctions as well. So... Just to like clarify, like what do you think like has been was the most impact? Like which kind of you know Russian, um, obviously like you know energy and other things, but like where was the impact the highest? Like what do you sure. think? You know because you, you, one could always argue, and I guess like um, that's you know like um, what has been mentioned several times by commentators is well you know you just like lean towards China then. Um, or like, you know, you, you sell uh, the kind of the, you know, the cheaper oil now has like, you know, goes through um, a third country and, you know, like all of these kind of like new mechanisms that came up. So, you know, um, so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I'll first say what I think has been effective on the West side and then I'll discuss the Russian sure. side where although Russia institutes its own sanctions policy, I mean, the Russian sanctions are often very silly. You know, Morgan Freeman, the movie star, is banned from going to Russia probably because he did one ad criticizing Putin's role in the 2016 election many times ago. But it doesn't matter whether Morgan Freeman can go to Russia or not, nor does it matter whether, you know, a certain Western official can have bank accounts there because they don't, whereas almost every Russian right. official or someone connected to them has had them in the West. So in terms of the West sanctions, what have been most effective in this state capacity question that we're talking about are really the central bank sanctions. Um, and then the sort of sanctions that follow around that usually um, the primarily seen as the swift measures targeting Russia's banks. And the reason why this has been so effective is not only did it freeze some 300 billion of Russia's um, foreign currency reserves at the beginning of the war that were held in the international system in Western countries. Um, but the simplest way to understand it is the impact that it's had is that as soon as a dollar or a euro or a British pound or even a Swiss franc crosses the frontier with Russia, um, whether that's digital or physical, that dollar, euro, Swiss franc, pound is worth less than any other dollar, euro, Swiss franc or pound anywhere else in the world right. um, because of the sort of costs imposed with getting around those sanctions. Now, the West strategy is to try to have that be as close to a 99 cent discount, say, as possible. Russia's strategy of countering the sanctions is really aimed at trying to keep that discount, you know, as close to zero um, as possible. And so we've seen a lot of moves one way or the other um, that, that have affected this. But overall, the Russian state has to dedicate tremendous resources and capabilities to try to get around that. And even then, um, simply because of the U.S. dollar's dominance, and you, you, in particular, although those sanctions are enforced by many other countries that are not the United States, because of the extraterritoriality of U.S. sanctions and its ability to issue secondary sanctions threats, that really is something that will remain a uh, challenge for the Russian state, no matter what um, happens in Ukraine going forward, and even caused Russia to fall into default, you know, within just a few months of the start of the war, um, which is something that will have real costs for Russia, even if it were to sue for peace for uh, years and years to come afterwards. On Russia's side, um, you know, really the sort of most effective tool um, in, in my view has been, um, you know, what I sometimes dub the inflation weapon, which is really a combination of Putin's threats on the gas markets, Putin's actions there. Uh, you know, the, Russia had stopped delivering a large majority of its gas to Europe on normal terms, even before the Nord Stream explosions, which we can certainly discuss later. Um, uh, and also had, you know, taken action to um, threaten global grain supply through its uh, actions in Ukraine and the initial threat to 
um, blockade its ports that was ultimately at least temporarily alleviated under the Black Sea Grain Initiative, but which we now see Russia talk about bringing back that threat as well. And I think that, you know, it has to be understood that when Putin launched his war at the end of February last year, the Russian state had already sent six months throttling, turning on and off various gas supplies to Europe, helping to drive up pressures there. And he took those actions at a time where the West was already, and really the whole world that was already coming out of um, COVID restrictions at the end of 2021, except for China, um, was experiencing big inflationary pressures as a result of that. And that made the timing for Putin in taking these economic actions together with his kinetic military actions actions in Ukraine able to cause particular pain points for the West. And Putin gave a speech last October where he talked a lot about sort of these inflation issues and essentially blamed the West for them and its actions against Russia for stimulating them. He you know, said it's not Russia's fault, but right. to me, the sort of subtext was very clear that this was a correlation um, be between the West response and, and um, the inflationary pressures. How effective that's been, um, I think, has been in terms of at least shifting the politics and opening up new loopholes and ways to weaken the sanctions regime, which is something that Putin was very effective at doing in Europe after 2014. I think that has been surprisingly ineffective, even if the effect on the global economy has been very large. But that is still a threat that the Russian state continues to use. It has other ways of using the pressure point, including potentially in oil markets going forward. Um, so I don't think that, you know, that the initial battle may have been, um, you know, uh, the initial attack by the Russian state with, with those tools may have been blunted, but I don't think that aspect of the war is entirely over yet. And while it didn't play a big role, say, in the U.S.'s midterm elections recently or in a number of European elections, those opportunities are still very much going to be there for the Kremlin to press those pressure points um, uh, when it sees um, it as being most beneficial to it to do so. If you would be an advisor to both sides, having you know looked at this like for a long time, what would you advise? You know, let's say to Putin or to you know several players in the Western world, um, how to win, so to say, or how to kind of like you know inflict more pain. Like, you know, what would you like from today? And like I guess so, this um, will go takes us in some of some some scenarios as well. Yeah. So on the Western side, um, you know, I think the sanctions are, are very effective sticks, but the West maybe hasn't been so effective at using carrots and, and offering benefits to other countries to try to uh, help. Um, counter some of Russia's attempts to uh, weaken the system. So, you know, one area that I've had particular concern around is, is Turkey, which, you know, trade data indicates has been used to re-export technology to Russia. That's particularly important for the chip sanctions that are meant to weaken Russia's ability to build modern weapons um, and to, to guide its missiles that, you know, carry out such devastation in Ukraine, um, but also from the monetary angle, because Russia does have ways, and I'm not just talking talking about, you know, uh, Russians being able to access Turkish bank accounts and send money one way or the other there. But I'm talking about the Russian state using Turkish projects, uh, in particular, it's um, gas pipelines there and then also a nuclear power plant that is being developed, uh, which it is used to effectively put its dollars that it has to use and and effectively gain more support from Turkey in that way. And that enables the continued um, shipment of things like chips and, and, and other issues. Um, I think that the West should have, rather than using sanctions threats against Turkey, as it had already failed um, with doing so with regards to Turkey's purchase of a series of Russian missile defense units in the previous years, which it finally imposed sanctions on in 2020, but that didn't really affect the Turkish sort of um, policy agenda. I thought that the United States should instead have offered um, the Turkish state its own credit supply lines, access to more U.S. dollars um, right. uh, to alleviate some of the economic pressures in Turkey. And therefore, um, you know, I, I mean, you, you could call it a bribe if you wanted to, um, but certainly um, convince Erdogan to be a more loyal friend. You know, now the timing for that is perhaps not ideal because of the upcoming Turkish elections next month. Um, you know, I don't think that the U.S. should be seen interfering one way 
way or the other uh, ahead of that, but I certainly think there was a discussion that should have been had that I don't think was properly had at the end of last year. That's just one example. There are right. plenty of others and places where I think the U.S. should use um, more um, carrots rather than sticks. On the Russian side, um, you know, I, I think that the, the Russian state is far more capable and has a far better understanding of these issues than uh, it's often given credit for. Um, what I will say is that, you know, I think Putin's idea of, you know, ultimately he, he, what he really wants to be successful is to undermine the dollar system, undermine the U.S.'s ability to impose these kind of sanctions um, on him and to, you know, hopefully build up an alternative. Um, because China is so much more of a, you know, economically powerful state, I don't think that he can do so without making Russia largely economically subservient to China. Um, there is the potential for a lot more nationalist backlash in addition to what there already has been uh, in previous years to sort of those trends um, in Russia itself. But, you know, I think that Putin made a mistake by um, trying to escalate this war globally uh, over recent years by, you know, bringing this fight not only in Eurasia and Turkey and using the traditional gas politics and um, some of those issues in Eastern Europe and the like, but really seeking to, you know, go out into Africa and get gold um, right. with the, the dealings with Wagner Group, its support for Venezuela. I think all of that needlessly increased tensions with the United States and um, made Russia seem an even more uh, global threat um, than it necessarily is you know we see that just now with the recent um, fighting in Sudan almost all of the American coverage is like oh is this you know Russia up to something um, and I think it sort of has has inflated the level of Russian threat which then has led to a stronger response from the West um, and one that uh, you know I, I don't think that the Russian state has or you know could hope to have the equivalent geoeconomic weapons to to fight that um, but Russia's best strategy uh, is not not that it hopes to win the economic war, but that it hopes that the West will lose through uh, internal divisions, through uh, those creating loopholes in the sanctions, creating uh, an environment in which Europe or, or even the United States doesn't want to continue with this agenda and wants to withdraw support because it sees the economic cost of continuing this conflict is too great. Um, and, you know, there I would say, uh, we will see the Russian state continue to support, um, you know, quote unquote, populist politicians around the world. And, um, you know, while it's certainly not the topic of this discussion, you know, the, the 2016 um, claims of Russian interference in the election and the like, if Russia is serious about this economic war, which I think it is, um, Russian interference attempts in the uh, 2024 presidential election in the U.S., particularly if the Republican candidate is Donald Trump, who I think effectively wants the U.S. to surrender on the economic war, um, you know, it will uh, and should, um, if I'm giving it policy advice on how to win and be successful here, uh, it should, um, you know, take far greater action to try to support uh, uh, an outcome where Trump or someone like him um, returns to power. And would that be also the what you think is the most likely scenario? Like how how this end up? Um, you know, like when we look at it from today, and we want to kind of like so so, so okay. So now we gave advice to both sides. That's how you know they should play it. So now, what's the most kind of probable scenario to play out? Um, I think that the West will continue to focus on sticks rather than carrots. It's more comfortable using them. We've seen the the growth of sanctions um, uh, in recent years, you know, quite um, significantly. Uh, there's a very good book that just came out about this that I'd like to recommend to your listeners called Bucking the Buck uh, by Daniel McDowell. Um, uh, whereas it's not so comfortable using um geoeconomic carrots in the same way often because it's you know seen as all oh, this goes against free market principles right. um and the like uh, which i think is a bit of a silly argument but but that's the way the discussion is uh, on the russian side um 
I do think they'll broadly follow that advice that uh, I gave. You know, my overall advice would have been, you know, not to escalate it as globally. I don't think they'll follow that. Uh, but I do very much think that, you know, they will look to do as much as they can to support Trump and the sort of narratives that he has. Um, you know, Trump himself has recently criticized Biden for uh he claims Biden is the one weakening the dollar system. I would say that Trump is entirely mistaken about that and that it was his presidency uh, that put it under greater threat than anything else, but we can perhaps discuss that later. Um, and I think that the Kremlin will, <coughs> excuse me, will really focus on trying to stimulate those divisions uh, within Europe as well, because Europe needs to approve its sanctions being rolled over um, every six months or more often every year, uh, whereas the U.S., it's very hard to lift sanctions. It's very easy to impose them. In some ways, it's the opposite in the European Union. Um, so I, I think he'll look to really you know, stoke those uh, divides there. Where exactly the next opportunity is, is... Um, you know, just because of the election calendar, um, there isn't a sort of great one coming up. Spain maybe, you know, could support the far right there, which might be needed for a coalition with the main center right party. There are a lot of linkages um, between that far right party, Vox and, and uh, Russian actors. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's an important enough issue for Spain to really exercise the veto there. But if it can find two or three more Orban type characters as there is in Hungary, um, you know, there it will um, really find ways to undermine it. We see this playing out right now in the aftermath of you know, the fifth elections in the last four years in Bulgaria um, mm -hmm. and in, in Slovakia as well. So it's taking place already on in some of the smaller European countries where I think he needs an opening, though, in, in a uh, major European state. Uh, and even in Italy, where, um, you know, Matteo Renzi, the former, uh, now again, deputy prime minister, um, leader of one of the um, right-wing parties there, Forza Italia, he once, you know, went to Russia with this shirt, you know, that said, you know, no to sanctions and signed a friendship agreement and the like. Um, but even, you know, that government that he's a member of, led by another right-wing party, has... Uh, supported the sanctions agenda. Um, so I, I don't think it'll be as easy in Europe going forward as it was in the 2014 to 2022 period, just because of the proximity and the level of you know horrors on, on display on, on the European um, doorstep in Ukraine.